Leo Mole has been dreaming of this moment for his entire life. It's a dream that lurks in the secret soul of every sculptor. A public park devoted exclusively to the permanent exhibition of his body of work. For Leo Moll, the fulfillment of his dream has a special sweetness. For most of his life, Moll has been an exile, blurring the details of his past to protect a family he hasn't seen for half a lifetime and more. His sculpture has been his passport and his haven, the one safe place where he could always feel at home. And now at last, like the sculptures in this garden, the scattered fragments of his life are beginning to come back together. As the official opening of the sculpture garden draws closer, the normally self-effacing mole finds himself the center of attention, an object of media curiosity. But you're a kind of a workaholic. You've worked hard all of your life, right? Yes, you see, this is a... I never considered it a work. It is really pleasure. Uh, enjoying so much. And I hope this enjoyment also transmitted to the people when they're looking. But the optimistic openness of his sculpture gives no hint of the hidden and sometimes tragic facts of his private past. That he has been able to overcome that past and attain such success is perhaps the true achievement of Leo Maul. And with this park, the first one-man sculpture garden in North America, his adopted community has given him the highest honor of all, artistic immortality. And this is above my own cast. Well, that's right. That's the one you cast at Bird's Hill. Uh, yes. <clears throat> How's that, Leo? How about to try this on Casson and that on Jackson? Okay. If you could. Yeah, that's better, definitely. Oh, it's much better. Because you see, in the sculpture, we actually has much of the color. It is only shadow and light. That's why it's so important to have the spotlight to right. set on the sculpture, you see. His art, which has enabled him so effectively to overcome his past, is also his strongest link to it. Leonid Molodashanin was born to the clay. His father was a potter who moved his family out of their native Ukraine to the mountain city of Nalchik in the Caucasus. When Leonid was 17, his father assembled the family for this photograph. He had a premonition that it might be the last time they would all be together. The next day, Leonid left to complete his education in far off Leningrad. The boy who arrived in Leningrad's Moscow station in the fall of 1932 had no particular plan beyond a determination to pursue a career in art, probably painting. It was a scary time in Russia, a time of shadows and steel. 
Stalin's power was at its height, and the symbols of revolution were everywhere. But no amount of revolutionary austerity could hide the splendor of Peter the Great's urban masterpiece. Today, the city of Lenin is once again the city of Peter. St. Petersburg has reclaimed its past, and Leo Moll, back on the Nevsky Prospect after an absence of 50 years, is here to reclaim his. As they did on that first day, his footsteps take him to the Winter Palace and the Hermitage, to the entrance called the Atlas Portal. It was uh, such an important for me when I just walked here. I was so impressed with these pieces. At that precise moment, I decided that is the place to stay here. Whatever it costs, I have to do it. And I immediately, the very next day, found work for me and so on. And that was, uh, I think, almost crucial point at the beginning when I came here first time to this particular spot. The St. Petersburg Academy of Art has been training classical artists since the days of Catherine the Great. The aspiring painter went to show his work to the Dean of Sculpture. He said, oh, you are not painter, you are sculptor. Look how you paint. You paint not like a painter painting. I said, what's painting? Just a little bit of a blue sky, a little bit green, it's grass, and there's a sculpture. Oh, it's very, very noble, you see. It's all... Oh, it's... <laughs> so the future Leo Moll began the slow step-by-step -step process of becoming a sculptor in the classical tradition doing the exercises, learning the craft, absorbing the time-tested techniques from those who had learned them before him. At the academy, instructors don't teach students how to be artists. They teach the skills that may enable them to become artists. You have to acquire the knowledge. On this, you could do anything you liked. But when you don't know the basic things, well, you are meandering and uh, you think you're doing uh, something creative, but it's all on a sand. It's just not formidable base. But it was in the Academy's private museum, with its copies of masterpieces from all over the world, that Leo found his passion for classical sculpture and learned the secrets of the masters. The youngsters, myself at the time, have really wonderful samples. And to come not only to look, we to come to draw, to study, to observe everything, how they movement, how they achieved everything, uh, because it is vitally important. If you make a cast from a living figure and putting together with the sculpture piece by Greeks, the cast from the living figure, it looks so flat. It seems to be almost shapeless. When there's a Greek people, it's so vital, it's such tense in the muscle and everything. That is a really great accomplishment by Greek sculptor. The young Molodoshanin proved a star pupil, scoring high marks and even selling some of his student pieces like this bust of the brooding Tchaikovsky and this remarkable portrait of a poet from the Caucasus.
and his first commission, a life-size portrait of the composer Alexander Borodin, still presides at the Conservatory of Music. Across its base, the signature of its proud young creator, and the date, 1939. In the close camaraderie of small classes, Leo formed friendships that should have lasted a lifetime. These two were lost in the years of exile. For 50 years, Mole has struggled to keep his friends in sight from half a world away, imagining entire lives from snippets seen in the news. None of his classmates has been easier to follow than Mikhail Konstantinovich Anikushin. His studio in an exclusive district of St. Petersburg is an indication of his enormous success in the world that Leo left. <laughs> Until six months ago, Anna Kushin had believed that Leo had died in the war. Now, after half a century, reunion. <laughs> in the Russia Leo left, Stalin's Russia, contact with an exile could be seen as treason. So Leo never got in touch with his old friends. But in the post-Soviet thaw, there is at last freedom to remember, to relive the old days. Though their lives have taken widely different routes for the past 50 years, each has been defined and directed by the profound experience of their shared training. It was the school that gave us skill, knowledge, love to our profession, devotion to our profession. With this, I was in a stranger place, and yet, on the basis of this knowledge and skill, I wasn't lost. In Canada, Mole still pursues his art with the dedication of a professional. Though well past the traditional age of retirement, for him the word is meaningless. The duty of the professional sculptor is to sculpt. Classical sculpture has always been the province of the wealthy and the powerful. 2,000 years ago, Leo's subject might have been a Roman senator. 500 years ago, a Medici or a Borgia. Today, it's the youngest son of one of Winnipeg's leading families. It's quite fashionable to say that, you know, you can't create anything on the commission. Nonsense. Through the history of art, it's most of the really major work. It's all commissions. Michelangelo's 16 chapel ceiling. It was a commission. It's really up to your ability to solve the problem what commission usually placing in front of you. Of course, you see, it demands certain discipline, I would say. A sculptor, it's probably just the same as a painter or a musician. You have to be in the shape. You must be in the shape to play the concert. And for that reason, I've done a hell of a lot of work. Many, many heads, just simply to keep myself in the shape. Mm. 
In the deft hands and intense concentration, it's easy to see the qualities that have made his reputation as a sculptor. What can't be seen, because he has so skillfully hidden them, are the scars of long past events that still haunt the inner man. The German invasion of 1941 caught Leo at home, inside the conquered territory. Along with every other able-bodied man, Leo was called to report for forced labor in Germany. By an incredible stroke of luck, he ran into an officer with no love for Nazi policies and an appreciation of art. He immediately expressed a great deal of interest in my uh, sculpture work. And that he said, you know, we feel for you it is a very difficult situation here now. We probably have to take you to Germany, but I will do everything possible for you that you wouldn't be stuck to the factory or uh, coal mine or somewhere working. And, I have a considerable connections in Berlin, and over there you will be working as a sculptor. And uh, so I have really no choice. Time for one last photo. This time, his father's premonition would be right. They would never see each other again. Yeah, that's it. In Berlin, thanks to his benefactor's contacts, Leo was able to continue to draw and sculpt, selling his work through a sympathetic dealer. It almost seemed that the rest of the war might pass him by.
Leo still had a student's passion to learn and could not fail to be fascinated by the dramatic sculpture being done in Germany, especially at the studio of Arno Brecker, who also happened to be one of Hitler's favorites. He spoke to his dealer about it. And I mentioned I would love to go and study with him. She was thinking for moments and saying, no, better don't go there. He's a very good sculptor, yes, but he's in a very bad company. Once, not the breaker, but around the breaker people, discovering that you're promising or capable young sculptor, they just can't stand it because you're from the East, you're untermensch, you're to belong to a lower race. It can't be even. And in, in, in Germany. So the sim they very simply could destroy. They give you a rifle and send it to the front, and that's it. And what do you fight for? It's very simple, you see. So I listened to that, of course. And I didn't go anywhere. In 1942, he met Margaret Schulte. By the time they were married, a year later, war had come to Berlin with a vengeance. In early 1945, with the Red Army pressing in from the east, Leo and Margaret joined thousands fleeing west. They managed to make it to Holland. In Holland, Leonid Morodoshanin became Leo Moll, partly for convenience and partly to avoid the attention of inquiring Soviet officials. They knew Leo could never return to the Soviet Union, and the Cold War made even Holland feel too close. So Leo and Margaret made the biggest decision of their lives. In late 1948, they set sail for Canada. It meant safety and a chance to build a new life, but it also meant leaving behind any chance to see his family again. The rough winter crossing was followed by three days behind a roaring locomotive to reach the frozen Canadian prairie. In Winnipeg, despite knowing no English, Mole immediately found work. Like any immigrant, he did whatever he had to to survive. If that meant being part of Eaton's Christmas display or turning out dozens of ceramic squirrels, well, so be it. But he was always on the lookout for more serious work and his first independent commission came barely four months after his arrival. He was hired to paint the ceiling on St. Edward's Church in Winnipeg. It was the beginning of a long relationship between Leo and the Catholic Church.
The 1950s were the journeyman years. Leo honing his skills by doing portraits of friends and colleagues, keeping in shape while he waited for the commission that would make his name, and getting to know the ways of his new country, even as events in the old country continued to preoccupy his thoughts. You see, after the death of Stalin, there is considerable changes going on, but still the system was there. See, I still didn't know what happened to my family. Are they dead? Are they alive? Where are they? So Leo lived with an almost superstitious dread of the harm that might result if his presence in Canada were known in the Soviet Union. For his family's sake, he invented a false past and banished the real one from public view. It was all the sweeter then, when his next big commission gave him a chance to dive into that past and celebrate it. The Cathedral of Saints Vladimir and Olga was the largest Ukrainian Catholic congregation in Canada, and their brand new building needed windows. Leo had learned stained glass technique in Holland, and he agreed to do 13 of them, each one five meters high by one and a half wide. In place of the usual biblical themes featuring saints and apostles, Leo chose to portray the history of the Ukrainian church. It was one of his few chances to explore publicly the world of his childhood, a world that had disappeared and taken his family with it. It was a mammoth job. It would take him 10 years to complete, and it would be interrupted by the opportunity he had spent his life preparing for. Taras Shevchenko is Ukraine's national poet. Ukrainian Americans wanted to erect a monument to him in downtown Washington. At the urging of his friend and fellow artist, Sviatoslav Hordinsky, Leo submitted a sketch with little hope of winning. But a few weeks later, he opened a letter from New York. It was a lovely, warm, quiet day. Margaret was in the home, and I sit down on the steps, and I'm thinking, what now? Margaret isn't here. So I took the car and drove to the cathedral, Volimir and Olga, where the Hardinsky was working. And uh, he couldn't hear. He's totally uh, deaf. So, but when you hit the scuffle, vibration, he could feel it immediately. So he looked down and I showed him. So he came down and I give him this, what I have there. He, on the arm, I said, mm, said I did, and he said to me, didn't I tell you, you are the winner? It was a huge commission, and they moved to New York for two years to complete it. To accompany the figure, Moll designed a relief of Prometheus in chains, Shevchenko's image for Ukraine under Russian domination. The unveiling in August 1964 was the event of the decade for the Ukrainian community. You have come from Canada, from Latin America and Europe, and from as far away as Australia to honor the memory of a poet who expressed so eloquently man's undying determination to fight for freedom and his unquenchable faith in ultimate victory.
for Leo, pride was mixed with uneasiness. The Soviet press was watching and muttering about anti-Soviet propaganda. And an American newspaper had published his real name. Was his family in the old country paying the price? The worry nagged at Leo. On the other hand, his international reputation was made. Invitations quickly arrived to do portraits of the famous and the powerful. Politicians and businessmen, artists and popes lined up to be immortalized by Leo Moll. There was another Shevchenko, this one in Buenos Aires. This time, Moll complemented the figure with a representation of Shevchenko's epic poem, Haidemaki, commemorating a bloody 18th century Ukrainian uprising against the Poles. Juggling many projects at once takes Mole out of Winnipeg for several months each year. Two or three times a year, he returns to Germany, where he does his bronze casting. Since the 1960s, Mole has used the foundry of Otto Strele near Munich. On this trip, he's casting two heads, the young boy and one of his brother done earlier. People and animals of his adopted land have become a favorite theme for both Leo and his collectors. Perhaps the most outstanding is Tom Lamb, his portrait of a pioneer bush pilot. In the posture, the parka, and the propeller, Mole has captured perfectly the essential elements of this powerful and purely Canadian myth. To a Canadian audience, accustomed to seeing art as personal expression, what is striking about Mole's work is his absence from it. Where in these figures are the events that have shaped his life? War, separation, the immigrant experience. Only in the subjects that are closest to him do we occasionally glimpse an image that might be Leo Mole in disguise. But the role of the classical sculptor is not to project himself, but to reflect the world he lives in. This is especially true of Mole, who has used his art not to express the events of his life, but to overcome them and to find his place in his adopted community. Just the same as a bus driving, bringing people, people from that place to that place. It is his contribution in a community. <coughs> in the same way, in a different form, I do my share. Thank you. 
very nice Hello, that you could make it. Yes, real. Yeah. Well, I would yeah. like to show now. Where is it? Where is it? Hey. What? To, huh? <gasps> I thought the rabbits would pop out. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, they're wonderful, Leo. They Thank are you. Wonderful. Oh, Thank no, you. No, no, it's just a wonderful. Great pleasure. You captured them yeah. at a moment no. in time. Now you don't do that forever, okay, you bore? <laughs> what do you say to Mr. Mole? Thank you. You're welcome. The sculpture garden is the climax to a remarkable career. All the more impressive because it didn't really begin until he was well past 40. But now his life's work will be gathered in one place to live on after him. A satisfying reward for a vigorous career. For Leo Mole, sculptor, life might seem complete. But for Leonid Morodoshanin, there was still one final thread to tie up. For almost 50 years, the question of what had happened to his family haunted him. In all that time, only one distressing trace. A visitor to Canada remembered his brother Victor from a Stalinist camp. Had Victor been imprisoned in retaliation for Leo's flight to the West? Afraid that contact from him might just make things worse for his family, he had written only one letter in all that time. There had been no reply. By the late 1980s, he had long given them all up for lost. Then one day in 1990, out of the blue, the postman delivered a letter from his sister. Nina, a child when he last saw her, was now living in Siberia. She had seen a newspaper story about a statue of St. Volodymyr in London. The sculptor's name was Leonid Morodoshanin. Hardly daring to hope, she had sent a letter to the sponsors in England. Eventually, it found its way to Germany, where Leo was working. When I received the letter in uh, uh, Germany at the breakfast time in the studio, I just came with a letter from Margaret together. Of course, I was quite sure it was from Margaret's letter, quietly uh, preparing coffee or something. I was ready now, open and. Uh, Suddenly, uh, look at, I just lost my breath. It's immediately, it was such a uh, impulse that crank. The uh, owner of the studio, this uh, Manfred, he very quietly, he said that I have just something dramatic changes. In the, he said, is it uh, something so bad at home? Very quietly. I said, no. It is a happiness, but let me alone now. I would. And I sit on the sofa quietly just to calm down. And I read it over and over. I just couldn't believe it. Yes, operator, I would like to call Irkutsk in Russia, but I don't have the code number of the city. Prashu? Nina? Nina? Подожди минуточку, Оля. Маргарет! 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 This 
conversation with her, it was difficult because both so emotional. I asked her when we were a little bit calmed down, we probably spoke might be a good 15 minutes or so, and I asked her about, do you know what's about Victor? It is the name of a brother. She said, yes, I do. I, I buried him. He died. His brother Victor, who had become a painter, had spent 11 years as a political prisoner and their father had died in a Stalinist camp after the war. Both had since been exonerated, but not before Leo's mother had died in exile and disgrace. Was it because Leo had not returned? He would never know. With her, Nina brings the past, photos and mementos he hasn't seen in 50 years. Nina, you have thought a lot about Leonid, you have talked a lot about him. He was always with us. We always thought about him, and we always thought about him. Ждали, мама всегда думала, что вот-вот он приедет, вот-вот он приедет. Все ждала его всегда. Поэтому всегда все тщательно хранили, все, что его касалось в семье. Нина, как вы чувствовали себя, когда вы получили телеграмму Леонида? О -о -о. Я, я потеряла сознание, я не, не могла ничего... Сообразите мне, ноги подкосились. Opening day at the sculpture garden brings out a who's who of the Winnipeg establishment. Politicians, business people, clients and friends. Among the last to arrive is the Queen's representative. And right behind him, the guest of honor. probably saved his life. Afterwards, it was his art that enabled him to build a new life in a foreign land. 
And in a final poetic irony, it is his art that has brought his family back and restored his life to wholeness.